who is a development analyst of NECBR, Wanderson Modesto, also a project analyst in NECBR, and Tim Bricers, senior developer, a senior software developer in LL Labs. So let them start with the tutorial. And please feel free to interact with them. Hello, everybody. I'm going to speak Portuguese, so you can use uh, translation and uh, do the entire tutorial with us. Let me start with uh, this uh, tutorial. Um, insurance, R RPKI routing, delegate mode, and I hope uh, you were paying attention to the previous uh, presentation because this is a complementary presentation. Many of the things that we saw in the previous uh, presentation will be complementary, of course. We will have a brief uh, re edition, but actually, it's a complement, especially in the delegated mode, as I showed earlier in the host uh, model, as we have, as we work in Milaknik and and in uh, and Brazil, as we don't have the host mode, we work with the delegated mode. This presentation will show you how you have a dialogue with uh, the VR registry. So Tiago will give you a tutorial, and afterwards we will. Uh, um, give you signs so that you can see the lab with us you, and you can learn how to configure it manually. And if you face any problems, you'll be able to uh, attend it together with us. It's going to be very simple. So here we are going to go through the room and uh, showing you uh, complementing information and uh, we're going to walk around and we're going to explain things to people who arrived late. For those of you who are working um, online or remote, we, we can't uh, offer you this possibility of the lab. So we are going to do it together. And uh, so only the ones in this room are going to be able to do it. But if you are online, you will be able to follow the configuration that uh, our team will do it. And then in the future, you can replicate it. And you can see how to use RPKI to provide security to the routing. So let's start talking about this tutorial. What is RPKI? It's a structure that is developed uh, to validate uh, numbering resources. We speak of ASNs and the IP prefixes, both IPv4 and IPv6 that have been assigned for you. And we are going to use them uh, jointly with BGP. So we are going to prevent some of the problems that we have with BGP, including BGP hijacking. Uh, and uh, but what happens is that RPKI only works if everybody works together. It won't work if one single provider gives it, and the same applies to IPv6. The entire internet must have IPv6. It's not enough. It's just one of us does it. It's you need collaboration. If we all collaborate, our internet is going to be more secure for for all. As a matter of fact, this is part of the Manners project, as was mentioned in the earlier presentation, and it's a way you can implement a routing security forms. And so there, in Manners, we tell you, um, we ask you all to sign this project. If you all use the best routing practices, thinking of a security, the internet will be better for all. RPKI is part of the best practices. Now let's understand how it can be of help. We have an example of how we are working with uh, how we work with BGP. To that end, we have a route 2001 DB8 slash 32 and slash 
48 notice that these routes are uh, announcing RPKI through different autonomous systems. We There we have 65538 and 65540. And please note that the true owner is 38. 40 actually is a fake owner, but the two of them are announcing it. So we start to see the uh, prefix hijack. And don't just PGP work with the two routes when we receive the two routes. Out, we are going to see the attributes and we are going to create the BGP table and after the BGP table we have uh, the we uh, assembly of the routing table with all the protocols and the router takes, uh, decides what is the specific route that they would take considering that scenario when we receive these two routes in BGP we have a preference for the more specific in this case 48 that is generated by the fake um, uh, that's why we say we say that there's a, a prefix hijacking. But with RPKI, we're willing to work with the validation of these announcements. So if somebody wants uh, to steal a prefix, like if uh, and uh, they try to use a more specific route when validating this, we're going to identify that the autonomous system could not, was unable to make that announcement. So we are going to discard it, as we said earlier earlier when uh, there is an invalid uh, state or uh, not found, and uh, we will mark it as invalid and we'll be able to discard this route and use only the one that is marked by valid, that is the true owner. So the traffic will go directly to that autonomous system. So notice that we are preventing um, the uh, prefix uh, hijacks. How does our PKI work? We get divided into two parts. We have here, we have a structure that gives a superficial view in the first part and the certification and a part of validation. As you see there, the, the uh, parent uh, certifying authority, then you have uh, a child cert certifying authority, then uh, the router and uh, the, router that, the router that talks to the autonomous system. So what we're going to see today is the certification part. But we also have the validation part. So, by explaining certification of resources that we are going to announce and the prefixes that we are going to, uh, in RPKI, we are going to create a data infrastructure, creating a prefix, and anybody that has uh, those uh, our resources will be able to use them. So, that will give us security. What security? Nobody will be able to hijack our, our prefix. We are going to have uh, the prefix announced in uh, RGP, and we are going to, we are going to certify saying that you can announce that prefix if somebody makes an attempt uh, to steal the prefix and tries to validate it. That you'll be able to identify that the prefix could not have been announced by a third party. So there, we are already correct uh, protecting our announcements and our prefixes. In the second part, we would uh, uh, consult the uh, validation. So we are going to uh, uh, ask about the RPKI. We're going to look it in the router. And we are going to, if somebody hijacked a prefix and we didn't receive that information, uh, we won't change our transit to the wrong address. So those are two independent things that we're going to work. One is certification and the other is validation. So this part of certification protects our announcements and validation protects the router from receiving wrong information. Now, this tutorial, in this tutorial, we are going to focus on certification, that is, and as you see, we'll, we'll see it in the red uh, rectangle. We're going to work uh, with uh, the parent certifying authority and uh, the child certifying authority authority and today with Ford with, we discuss the validation and we are going to tell the router so as not to receive the wrong information in this tutorial we are going to focus only in certification part because here we have uh, uh, when when we work with LACNIC this is different LACNIC has the hosting part but NICBR doesn't so we're going to do the delegates part of 
of what was delegated. We have to talk with the NECBR system, but um, so you can use this delegated uh, system also in the part of information of LACNIC that's not Brazilian. If you're not Brazilian, you can use the delegated mode to talk with LACNIC. It has pros and cons. Each mod mode has its good things and its bad things. We'll discuss it later. As to the certification, we work with digital certification. We associate a public key with its owner. We speak uh, of asymmetric uh, uh, encryption because we work with a, a pro private uh, key and a public uh, key of what one does, the other one undoes. So we need to have a, a password uh, with which you can open your private key and uh, a password for a public key that is absolutely open, uh, it's, it's public. So there you'll be able to see with your public key, the people know that you own that resource because what one does, the other one undoes. So whatever you do with your private key, anybody that has your public key will know that only you could have done that and the other way around. Now, if you wanted to send encrypted uh, uh, data, you take the public key and only those with the public key can uh, um, undo the encryption. But if we have a signature with a private key, only that person will be able to use it and the other ones will only be able to confirm it. And then we're going to work with the RPKI, that is the public key infrastructure. And it gives you a certificate uh, uh, by a certifier. We have an example in Brazil that is ISP Brazil. That's the authority that does it. But we're going to speak of LACNIC and NECBR. That is the case of RPKI. And then we're going to get the certification of resources. And we're going to seal the uh, uh, public part. So to understand how PKI works as a certification chain, we have the certificate authority that are reliable are trustworthy entities with well-known public keys. Remember, it's public. And there we're going to use the root key. That is the highest part on top of uh, the drawing, A and B in the drawing. That's uh, the root um, that, that's used uh, to sign the keys that follow in this chain. You sign the ones below. So you reach the lowest level that are F, G, H, I, and J. Now, one signs the other, and that's how we work. So it's important to protect the more critical keys. We are talking of the private keys because the model, it's an asymmetric encryption model. Let me show you how the same structure works uh, inside RPKI. We have uh, the root uh, um, the case is Afrinic, Apinic, Arian, Lacanic, and Ripe, and CC. And then we have, those are the root uh, CAs. And then we have the child CAs, JPNIC, and Nick BR. And then the provider will come in the child CA in the middle. So we are going to use the grill. That's a tool that we're going to describe later. And we're going to talk with NECBR, and NECBR will uh, talk with LACNIC. So that is the hierarchy. Here, in the case of LACNIC, you have an arrow that points downwards because you needn't speak with NIC.BR. If you're not in Brazil, you're going to directly speak with LACNIC, and you can use that delegated mode with LACNIC and installing the same software as with us, but instead of speaking with NIC.BR, you're going to speak with LACNIC. Here we have the CA root because these are self-signed certificates. So you start signing these and then all along the chain, everyone else signs these. That is how we have this hierarchy throughout the certification chain for RPKI. Now going into the certification authority, I will now give the floor to Anderson and then we'll be looking at the tutorial parts. Hello, I am 
Oh, Anderson, I will be speaking in Portuguese. So we go back to this part on the certifying authority. Like we said, we need to have an entity which we trust. And this is so that we can really certify whether what we are stating we are authorized to do so. So in this case, what we have, so let's go back a bit. So here we can see that we have the parent certifying authority. Then we have for the RIRs, we have LACNIC, RIN, AFRINIC, and all the five RIRs that are the certifying authorities, the parent certifying authorities. These are the authorities that deliver the resources. So when you wish to request numbering, and depending on where you are located, you have to speak with one of these entities. These are the entities that do the resource assignment and have the authority to certify whether what you are stating you are allowed to do so or not. So now <coughs> let us look at the parent certifying authority. And because we are in Brazil, <coughs> in the case of NIC.br, we do that intermediation. If you are in Brazil, you will be speaking with NIC.br and we are doing that initial certification part of the resources <coughs> to exchange keys with the BR registry. So here we have those organizations that distribute resources, like I was saying. They are the ones who own these resources and know what each owns. Below those entities, we have several other entities until we reach the final one, which are those providers that will have to speak with the entities that are upwards along the certification chain. <coughs> Each RII can be an authoritative source for allocating resources. They have the capacity of delegating the IP addresses and the ASN, so we have a say N which is that certifying entity that is going to determine that that IP address is associated to the ASN. And based on that, it is changed, signed with that exchange of keys. And Tiago in the tutorial will show you how this is done in LACNIX region and in NIC.br. Now here, as we heard in the previous tutorial, we're going to look at this file, this document, which we call ROA, Route Origin Authorization. This is a signed object. This is digitally signed and it states, I authorize this ASN, XXX, to originate this prefix. So everyone can do queries to that ROA. This ROA states that ASM 2020XX can generate this prefix. And if anyone looks at this number, they will look up that and they check whether this ROA has been certified and then they verify whether that certifying authority really is confirmed. That route, if that is not the case, it will be considered invalid and we're going to filter that announcement because it is likely that it is someone who has intention of doing hijacking. We are aware that there can be human errors. We can be in BGP trying to do this and by mistake, we can write something, we can type something by mistake. In addition to those malicious attitudes, it can also occur that there are human errors. So we are subject to those types of human errors, so we can try to protect ourselves from malicious activities as well as from accidents. And this is the case if there was a misconfiguration. So as I was saying, we have this rower which indicates a prefix that might be originated by this ASN. So as we saw previously, you can also include the aggregated route or the specific prefixes. Here you can, for example, 
put a slash 20 to a slash 24. So all those announcements within that range will be validated by that ROA, by that ROA. So in addition to that, all the announcements have to be registered in more than one or more ROAs. This happens when we publish a ROA. It will then go to the RPKI repository and then will remain there globally to be consulted when we do validation. So the validation software will then go through the RPKI repository. Following that, a dialogue takes place between the router and the validating software in order to classify each of these routes if there is a ROA for that purpose. Now let's have a look. We will look later on that we have to be very careful when we start using RPKI. When we have our ROAs and we publish and make an additional publication in BGP, we will have to recall that you have to verify that everything is okay in the RPKI. Otherwise, my route can be invalidated. We own those routes. That is our prefix. But there is a ROA that states that we are not publishing anything more specific. So it is also necessary to take that into account and to be cautious about this. So let us assume that an organization wishes to assign its resources to other ASNs, to other ASs. First, you have to generate a ROA with your own announcements of your own AS. For example, you have an ASN and you're assigning resources to your clients. So you have to generate ROAs for your own clients. Now. We have to remember that if we take one step backwards, we have a kind of ladder. So you have the parent certifying authority, the child certifying authority, and you can generate a certificate for another organization so that the customer can generate their own ROA. So you can do this in the two ways. If there is a ROA for that prefix, the origin of that route is validated. If it is incorrect, it is worse than not publishing it. And this is what we mentioned previously. Now, what would occur if we don't have a ROA for that specific route? In that case, it will be classified at not found or not known. And it is likely that it will be included in that ASN list that still do not use RPKI. Now, if there is no document that mentions that this can be published, that that ROA, that ROA can be published, it will remain as unknown. So at that time, they are not being filtered in the routing table. Nowadays, there are best practices, for example, filtering out the unknown routes certifying only those valid routes. So we accept the valid routes. There is no ROA for that route when it is unknown. So if that does not appear, it's probably because the autonomous system still does not have the RPKI, or is only starting the RPKI study. So we have two modes for RPKI for operation. Previously, we spoke about the hosted mode. Those that are not in Brazil will directly dial, have the dialogue with LACNIC. We also have the delegated mode. This is a mode we implemented in Brazil with NIC.br. Now, how does a delegated mode work? You need to install a software in order to work with resource certification and creation and publication of the ROAs. This software is Krill. We have here the developer of Krill, and he'll be expanding on this later on. And you will see that the entire generation of the CAs and the keys with uh, regist re registered keys will be in a server and you will be managing this in then the autonomous system will be controlling that administration, will be working with this Krill software, and it will directly have a dialogue with Nick VR's registry. So we'll be updating the keys with Nick.br and see how these rollers are published. 
as I was saying, this will work in the in the framework of our tutorial only for those who are here in Brazil. Those of us who are here right now and wish to work with us in this lab, we're going to provide guidance as to how pre to prepare us. So as I was saying, we have a delegated mo mode. This is the one we use in Brazil. This facilitates automation. It allows us to work with some scripts and to speak directly with Quilp through the commands. It centralizes management of the rowers within the owner organization of these resources. So we need to have a server where Quill is being executed in order to publish the rowers. All this is under its own administration. You will need to have your own private key. And as I mentioned before, if you are an entity that delegates resources to your own clients, then you will have the capacity of delegating the certifying authority to your certificates in order to for them to manage the own RPKI. As I say, the delegated mode has the the arc through this up-down protocol. Does this all through the up-down protocol? The generation and validation of the repository and the storage of the public, private keys, in addition to submitting certificates to sign them in the parent certifying authority, which is named PR, will be left to the criterion of this protocol. This protocol will publish the certificates and also the rowers. Let us have a look at what we need in order to use the delegated mode. In other words, RPKI in delegated mode. We need this software, Quill. Quill was developed by NLNet Labs. Tim is here with us today, and he will tell us about this. We're going to install this in our own server. You will be able to manage that server yourselves. Now, what is Quill? Now, let me tell you in general terms, but I would like Tim to then expand on this. Now, Quill is basically a software that we use to create, generate, and publish the CAs and the rowers. You will be able to do this. Quill has an interface and a command line. You have a graphic interface, and you can also work with command lines, I would say. So this makes it things easier, because when we look at the graphic interface, and we see this in operation, in fact, then you will be able to work with automations and with some more sophisticated functionalities, because it also allows you to have commands. So you don't need to upload a service to a machine or to a server that has a graphic interface. You can just use it with command lines. <coughs> it is very important to maintain your Quill server always active. Remember that the RPKI documents have a validity period, so you need to validate this always. The Quill server will be having a dialogue with nick.pr in order to carry out the automatic updates on a regular basis. If uh, the query server is not active, NICBR won't be able to uh, use it, uh, and all that is uh, will be considered as if you weren't using RPKI because the, uh, the rower that was certifying your resource will no longer exist, and we are going to go back to the classification of unknown. There is no route, nor is there our certifying authority certifying that you can publish that announcement, in fact. So it's important for the CREA server to be active, to be available. If there was a power problem and the server was not connected for hours or maybe four days, there's no problem. However, if there may be problems when you need to update or to validate something and CREA is unable, to talk to the NICBR registry. 
So it will go back to the state uh, stating that it is not using RPKI. Maintenance is essential. Don't forget RPKI. The BGP needs to update uh, the uh, rowers. Here we brought a case of um, those who used NS3215, and uh, there were several announcements uh, of uh, uh, of 16, and they had a row for each of the announcements. The SN here can publish that slash 16. However, because of internal political issues, they decided to change the announcements, and they started publishing a slash 17 that's more specific. But they forgot to update the RPKI. That is, even though they are the ones that own that resource, and they were they could use that at slash 17. The problem was that was that there was a rower that uh, was saying that ASN 3215 only published slash 16. And all of a sudden, um, uh, a slash 17 appeared on the internet. So those uh, announcements were invalidated. So you have to remember that if I update my <coughs> Routers. Then, I, if I, I have to update the grid because if not, the BGP will be inconsistent. And you also have to develop the right rower, making it more specific. So, um, updating uh, the um, uh, announcements. And if you need this, and this is something that we repeat in the courses when we give uh, RPKI classes, we ask who's already used it, and we see that there are very very few people that are familiar with, with RPKI. Some uh, are using it less frequently, but we show you all this, uh, how, it, how this works, and we're going to show in the tutorial that Tiago will, is about to show you. And in that phase that we, well, for, for quite a while we've been talking about RPKI and you're going to see the monitoring system that uh, um, informs about the configurations uh, and uh, checks whether they are correct. So this is an additional help when you decide the configurations and so on. Now we're going to see how we install Krill. We're going to see it work. We are going to make it available in the, at the lab. So if you want uh, to uh, be to come to the lab, you can do it. And Tiago will give you a demo explaining all the details. So if you wish, uh, you'll see how you access the lab, and you can do it step by step. Eduardo, Lucas, myself, we are all here to help you, to guide you, and we are going to mimic all uh, the uh, Krill uh, uh, part and all of the publication of exchanging keys with uh, the BR registry and uh, the row, etc. So now Tiago will share his screen and will walk you through the tutorial. Now, if you want to do it in your own machine, you can download the commands. Tiago will show you. And I'd like to know who wishes to do it in your own computer? Raise your hand so we, we, we can give you a password to each of you. So please keep your hands up. Please uh, feel free to raise your hands if you want to do it yourself. So Lucas is going to circulate the groups and he is going to give you the passwords. The access is shared with Tiago. Good afternoon. Well, good morning. As a matter of fact, I'm Tiago. I'm a Nick VR trainer. And I'm going to show you step by step how to configure Krill from your uh, machine from, from the time you install it to the time you publish the prefixes under Krill. The members of our team are walking, are in the room, uh, giving people passwords. If you keep your hand raised, uh, 
they'll give you one. But anyway, we're going to do it together. So if you can't do it in your own laptop, just uh, follow the what's happening in the screen. So let's start by, well, first you need to have model classroom NICBR, dot NICBR. There in that website, we have some courses available. We have the LACNIC part here. So you can have access to LACNIC 40 tutorial. There you have BGP with Krill. We also put, um, posted uh, the slides, the, the, the lab, just in case you want to cut and paste, a copy and paste. I'm going to open it for you to see. So this is the lab that we are going to uh, work with. So now you are receiving the groups. Now, in order to access the lab, we are going to have access to this uh, link lab. Uh, uh, course uh, Septro BR, and uh, that will uh, send you to this website where you log in, you log in, it's going to request your data to start. You are going to be in a group. So to enter the system, the login is log, that's the username, and uh, the subgroup, the subgroup is uh, 90, and the password is lack group, and the name of the group. So you log in with uh, LACNIC uh, 90. It's a uh, group, LACNIC group 90. So you are going to enter with uh, the uh, number that you will be given by the group house. If it were 23, it would be LACNIC group 23. So when you access, choose HTM mode N5, um, the one at the bottom. So please don't forget to select that access HTLM and 5 because if not, it will make you install a picket and that's not necessary. So there you log in. And this here is a tool that is called ING. Uh, it's a, a simulation and virtualization system for networks. In this case, we are using Linux machines to configure the CRIL. Uh, you are accessing our NECBR uh, server remotely for the purpose of this experiment. Now, if you manage to enter in HTM5, the lab well, you entered my account. I imagine that that could happen, but okay. So, access with uh, the number that you received. We are going to enter by clicking on the machine. And here you will access the virtual machine that is uh, using, uh, that the system is using. So by using this machine, uh, my tip is that to open the browser of your machine and to download the lab. That is downloaded. But to that end, we need an initial step. That is to configure the network because this lab has a limitation. So I have to change the MAC address in the, of the, the machine to receive the IP and have access to the internet. So those who enter the lab, uh, well, you, you'll have to configure the change in the MAC address precisely to be able to use uh, the internet and to download the uh, lab to your machine because it it won't be until you do that that you'll be able to open all that. So I'm using this machine.
I downloaded it. I've already downloaded the lab. You can do that later, too. So let's start. There are, two, are there many people that haven't been assigned a group yet? So as you receive your group, you can enter and you can follow the lab step by step. What will be the initial step? This doesn't have to do with grill, actually. This is a restriction posed by the lab. As we use uh, IVI when we uh, use it at the lab so that you can have access, the Linux machine uh, specifically uh, uploads it with the same MAC address. So when you do, everybody is going to connect to the same MAC address, so you won't have a connection. That is why we need, you need to change it. That's a lab restriction. So I'm going to configure it here. <clears throat> so well, as you may have seen, we have Eduardo and uh, Lucas that are here in the room. If you have any doubts or any inconvenience, uh, if you can't do that, you may raise your hands and they will help you. So, the first step, I'm going to try to enlarge my screen. I'm enlarging the font. I'm going to enlarge it further. So, you here we have the terminal and the lab. So the first step that we are requested is to turn the interface off or to disable it. And we're going to write sudo uh, dns3 well, sudo lp link set dev n3 down and the password is scepter so here you are turning the interface off then it requests us to change the mac address so we enter sudo lp link set dev ens3 and uh, the address, the MAC address. This is what we will use, 00502004. And be careful with the following, where it says XX in the PDF, that it's there that you must enter the n your group number. In my case, it's 90. So here we're going to change the MAC address to this new address. So now we have this configuration. Instead of putting down, we're going to put up to go back to the interface. So these are the three commands we're going to use. Once we finish with the setup, we're going to check IPDDR and show to see whether this interface is correct. Here we see ANS3 interface, which is connected up. It received IPv4. And so they tried to do ping to see whether internet connection exists. So you can end up ping not VR to check. Ping is working. So we have connectivity to the internet. So this is a very important step. It is necessary to have access to the internet in order to work in the lab. Now, why is this so? Part of the configuration is done with our server, which is setting up Krill and configuring Krill. But there's another part that has to pair this service with the VR registry. So this delegated mode 
has to have this communication of the two servers. So it's not enough just to set up things on our side. We also have to access the registration service and enter the data of our server. Otherwise, this wouldn't work. So it is important to have this access. Now let us have a look at this first step. As I told you, this doesn't have to do with the grill configuration. It's just a restriction of this lab. So after that, what we will do is to install grill. Here we have some of the commands. It might occur that at a given moment, the people of NL Labs changes the step by step, but because there was an update or because there is something that is different. So what I would recommend is to always access their website because they are the developers of this application. So that is the original source. So NL Labs will provide the latest information, NL Net Labs. So I do recommend to access the latest available information in the website of NL Net Labs. In this case specifically, there is a small problem over here in the library lib cur. We have to uninstall this and then reinstall it. So that is why we have this file n.x because once it is connected to the internet, you can access the website with the Moodle and download the lab in docs. So you can copy and paste it. I already have this lab in a .x file in the virtual machine, so I can copy and paste the commands. And this makes the job much easier and also decreases the likelihood of making mistakes in the command. So let us proceed. I'm going to zoom out a bit so we can work with the commands. So the first thing that we will do is to remove this library, which is producing problems. I'm going to remove this initial slash. So we have sudo apt remove lab and it will be uninstalled. Next step, we are going to install some of the pre-requirements. Here, in this case, we are going to install some of the elements. We have the, some of the libraries, some different libraries, which it is now downloading, and it is working in the installation in Krill, in installing this in Krill. Now, the next step that we need to do is to add the Krill repository in order to proceed with the setup. Now, likely, it is likely that in the future, this will be available in the APT repository, and this will make things even easier. But so far, there is no secret. We're just going to insert this NLNet Labs packet in the repository of our Linux and then we'll have the update of this APT packet. I'm going to download this repository. And after that, here in source.list, I will now add the APT of the repository. Now, I recommend to copy this, if you have a mistake, it won't be easy to identify what the error is. So in the website of NLNet Labs, you can copy and paste. The best thing is to copy and paste. So we're going to put it over here. If you're going to take this from the website, please be careful because there you have to select the Linux distribution. In our case, we are using a specific machine and we have to 
access the correct repository. Once we have the repository, we just have to enter sudo ubt update. I made a mistake, it's apt, not upd, he corrects himself. So now, yes, here it is taking the repository of NL Met Labs in order to have this updated. And finally, we're going to install Krill. So, were you able to follow the different steps? So far, so good. Did you manage to install this? If you have any questions, please raise your hand, and one of my colleagues will help you out. So now we install Grid Grill. So let us have a look at what we have to do. Now we have to configure this. We have to set this up. Now, the configuration of Krill is also included in this file we have over here, krill.conf. You can use a command such as nano or vim or what you consider is best to configure this file. I'm going to zoom in so you can see it better. This is a configuration file for Krill. Here you can customize whatever you need. For example, over here, it names the folder where the Krill files will be stored. And it also shows where the PID is, the different logs, and everything that you need in order to customize this in the Krill. So you can do this with this file here, for example, a specific IP or some of the elements that we have to disable. So everything involving the Krill configuration is done over here. If you need to do specific configuration, then you can change it in this file. In our case, we're going to use the standard configuration, but we're really going to change one of the parameters, which is admin token. We need this in order to log in to Krill. So you can leave admin, but we're going to change it to make it simpler to access this lab. So we're going to change the admin token, and we need to put here septro. If you enter with that nano command to save this, you have to click Control plus O and to exit Control plus X. So we changed the access password. It's now Septro. Well, in fact, here it says LACNIC40. So I have to do this once again and enter LACNIC40. And this is what we did previously, Control o to save. Good. Now, if we, we finish the configuration, and we can now start with the service. We're going to click on Enable to access the Quill services. We now enter the command systems, STM, and Krill, now it is active. And now we wish, if we wish to verify the status, we enter pseudo system CTL status. It shows us that the status is active, and it shows us other data of this service. Now Krill is being executed, and where is Krill being executed? It is done in this link over here, HTTPS, localhost, and the 3000 dot. It's important to put HTTPS, and then you'll enter the Krill service through the 3000 dot. So once again, here in the browser, we're going to put this link up here, localhost. And then there is a warning stating that it is something that is potential, potentially risky because it has a self-signed certificate, which is SSL, 
but this is not a problem because you are entering through the local phone. So let us click on advanced. Here we see that this is a self-signed certificate and that we're sure that we want to enter. Now we click on like seven and we continue. This is the graphic interface of Quill, which is called La Costa. We can work here with the command line. So if you install this in a server that has no graphic interface, you can also use the entire configuration using commands. We're going to use a graphic interface here because this makes things easier for those who are not familiar with these commands. And also, it is easier to visualize the configuration. Krill is also available in several languages. One of these is Portuguese. So if you prefer, you can select the language of your preference. Over here, we see we have to enter the password. This is a password we use for the setup when we man modified the admin token. Remember, it's LACNIC40. So over here, it is asking us to create the name of our certifying authority. After that, we will be enabled to change this. So if required, if we should change the name, we have to recreate it. It doesn't have to be a unique name. You can just put any name. There's no problem with that. It doesn't matter if you repeat it because when we do pairing in the registry, it will generate a unique name. But let us think of a name that identifies the provider, particularly if you then expect to manage more than one AS within Krill. If you're going to administer or manage different providers, it is recommended to identify these with the names of certifying authorities as well. In this case, we're going to create something based on what the file says. And this would be LACNIC CA. We're going to create it with this name. And you'll see that there is no problem there if you create it with the same name. So we're going to put LACNIC 40. CA, that will be the name. So this was created already. We have here the created certificate authority. This is the configuration page for Krill. We have the rowers. We also have the parent certificate certificate authorities and the repository. So what do we have to do now? We have to enter the website of the registry in order to do the pairing of the configurations. How do we go about this? Well, in the real world, you will have to be the AS administrators. So you have to log in. And if you are the AS administrators, you will have the RPKI configurations. But you have not. If you're not the AS administrator, you won't see those configurations. This is just a security measure to be sure that only the administrator can do this part of the configuration. In the case of our laboratory, we're going to enter a beta. Enter beta.registro.br, and you have to enter with an account. Login and password are the ones we have over here. So once again, go to the Moodle. And in the Moodle, you will now see the information. Login beta, beta registro.br. Here you have the information for each of the groups, considering the number of groups you received. You have a login and a different password. So look up your group information, your login, and your password. And really check this out, because there are uppercase, lowercase, L letters that might look like an I. So you have to be very careful when you do the login, because you might have some inconvenience. Once again, I repeat that if you have any questions, please let me know. Raise your hand, because our colleagues are here to help you out. And they will be, uh, can, can go to your, where you are. Now, enter the registro.br website and log in. When you access here, you have the login with the group 90, which is my group. And you will now see this page. 
Oh, it was disconnected. I'll log in once again. I have to click on the capture to demonstrate that I'm human. This is the most complicated part of the lab because I have to select which of the images are a pizza. Well, I don't know. Let's see. Let's see if this, uh, this is a pizza. Maybe this one over here. This is for sure a pizza. This might be a pizza. Okay, I'm a human. Still, I'm a human being. Good. So this is a difficult part. It's not so easy to demonstrate that I'm a human being. Okay. So you have to validate this capture. So I logged in. You will now enter this website. You click on the here and who is the owner and you click on ASN and at the bottom you will see the RPKI configuration. This part over here only will appear if you are the AS administrator. In this case, in the case of the beta, because we have the administrators, we're going to click on configure RPKI. So once we enter the RPKI part, we have a tutorial that explains how to enable this, what it is. But let's do this in practice. It's requesting child request. And what should we do in this case? Well, we go to the Quill service, we click on parents, which is a parent certifying authority, and we click on add an additional parent. So we have child request. So we click on copy, and then we're going to paste this in this part where you do the registration. So now we have the child request. When you click on enable, it will then create this information here, which then creates another XML, which is a parent response. So you made a request and you received a response. You have to also copy the parent response and paste it in the registration we have to paste it in Krill. So now, where we have the parent response, there we have to paste this XML that we obtained. Now, this XML has to do with this certifying authority, which is not NICBR.ca. And it has to tell me the name of the certifying authority. So I enter NICPR underscore CA. So we now completed all the information. We click on confirm. And the next step is that you and the BR registry know one another because you are communicating through the up-down protocol. And you now have the capacity of authenticating one another's data. But what is now missing is the publication. We have to enable publication. This means that we have to leave the rowers hosted in the BR register. So we now click on repository, and once again, we're going to scroll down to the configuration of remote publication. We follow the same process, but this now has a different name for the XML. Here we have the publisher request. We have to go to the repository, click on repository, and then we have the publisher request. There we copy this. We check the registry page, and then we click on Enable. Once we have the publisher request, we're going to receive another XML called Repository Response. We're going to copy this XML, and then we're going to paste this once again in Krill. So we copy, we paste, we click on Confirm, and it's ready. We, we've already configured the server. The authentication with uh, the PDR uh, uh, is ready, and uh, so is the remote connection. The rules that we'll communicate from now on will be stored in the registry system. Okay, now what's missing? Now, the only thing 
we have to do is to start working with our ROA configuration. Let's see what we want to publish. I recommend you to update your, the website or click on F5 because we already have the IPv4 and IPv6 uh, information available. As a security measure, precisely, uh, we can't publish any data that, uh, are, that don't belong to your specific uh, block 10.90, your AS. So here we have 65590. That, and the prefix is 10.90. So here, for instance, I'm going to publish a slash 22 to slash 22 So these are the rows that I'm going to publish. So I'm going to choose what I want to validate. For instance, if I only want to publish the slash 22, I'll publish it like this. If I want to publish a range of addresses, then I'm going to enter as ASN65590. The prefix is 10.90.00 slash 22, and I'm going to publish it down to slash 22. This and also enables me to publish a range of addresses. So it's a Inval it's not inv it's invalidating the, the first one because the second one also includes it. So if we want to delete it, we click on uh, the bin and uh, I uh, delete it. And then uh, we, uh, if we want to uh, include a row that is not part of the uh, block, uh, something uh, of the prefix 89, if I try to publish a row that doesn't belong to me, it won't allow me to do that. And what does this happen? Because we don't have any permissions to publish. This is this doesn't belong to me. It's a security measure. And as a security measure, I can't publish any ROAs that don't belong to my blog. So far, so good. So this is the step-by-step -step of the Creel configurations. You saw that it's quite simple, no secrets. Basically, the idea is to change the information of one certificate to the other. You can do it through the graphic. Uh, interface and then configure the rules that you would like to include in your system. Is everything clear so far? Do you have any doubts, any questions? If you have any questions, you can raise your hands and uh, our team will help you. So now Tim will make some comments. Tim, you have the floor. Hola. Okay. Sí. De hecho, yo hablo un poquitito de portugués, pero no lo suficiente como para hacer toda la presentación en portugués. Sí, estoy esperando. Bueno, aquí están las diapositivas. Quería hablarles brevemente de... So in the past year, um, our focus hasn't been on changing the functionality, really. So for most users, um, there are not many observable um, changes. Um, but we ha what we have done is we've actually re-implemented the user interface uh, from scratch. It's no longer Lagosta, actually. It's now called something else. Um, We've been working on the server side things, and we've introduced uh, support for a new object type called uh, ASPA that, um, well, wasn't introduced just yet, so maybe it's a bit of a, an advanced topic, but essentially this is about um, securing more than just the origin of a BGP announcement, but um, it would allow you to make uh, statements that make the, uh, the path also plausible, because with origin validation, technically, People can lie about the path, and with ASPA, that will become much harder. Um, 
What is coming in a couple of weeks is a new release that, again, doesn't really include many functional changes, but under the hood a lot of stuff has changed because we've been preparing um, to support clustering of um, Krill installations in the future. So a lot of um, work has gone into how data is stored and how transactions are handled. Um, so that's coming soon. Um, for the moment, it is still limited to a single node disk-based uh, setup though. But um, with the next release, um, we can take this work and augment it and then uh, start supporting initially PostgreSQL as a database um, storage solution. And that would allow you to run multiple um, Krill nodes in parallel. Did I do that? Okay. Um, anyway, the other thing that's planned in the short term is um, updating the ASPAS support that I just mentioned because, um, well, it's a bit unfortunate that we implemented it just too soon because afterwards the profile of this uh, RPKI object changed and uh, the, yeah, if you use Krill now to create ASPAR objects, then they will be rejected. This is not really a big deal because it's very early uh, phases of, of ASPAR adoption um, and it wouldn't result in anything painful. It would just show up as not found as though you're not doing anything uh, with ASPAR. But uh, it will be fixed soon. Now, the last thing, um, I'm not sure if this is the best uh, place to do it, I will be around, so you can also talk to me in the hallways, but I'd really like to also know what, what it is that you run into with Grill. Is, are there things that you would like it to do? Um, what would be your priorities? Um, so one of the things is the, the ASPA support initially comes uh, only with support in the command line interface and the API, um, but we can build a UI for it. Um, yeah, so in this lab, you're using uh, private IP resources. So you don't really get to see um, the ROAS suggestions that Krill normally has. Um, but this is a system that's based on, uh, well, it uses data from the ripe uh, RIS uh, collectors, root collectors all over the world, um, to show you a suggestion based on, you know, what Krill believes might, you know, happen in the real world. And it, and it, suggest that maybe you want to create ROAS for these things, um, but ultimately that choice is always up to you. Now the problem with that is a bit, well, multifold. Um, the information can be quite old, can be up to eight hours old, and also if you make an announcement that's um, root origin uh, invalid, then it may actually never make it out to these um, collectors, so you may never see it, or at least Krill may never know about it. So one thing we're thinking of is bringing in a local feedback loop and allow you to have like a local PGP feed in, in some way into Krill so you can get a um, yeah much quicker and local view of what you think should be happening. Um, then, yeah, you were using the admin token to log in. There's also a named user login support in Krill, but it's all command line and you need to copy and paste things. One of the things we're thinking of is uh, elevating that and making a, um, uh, a system that you can just use from, uh, from the UI itself. Um, another thing is uh, Krill actually keeps all history, everything you do is there, but it's currently only available through the command line interface. So we figured that that might also be a good next candidate you know, on the functional level to, uh, to allow you to, to see, you know, when was a change made and, and, and who made it. If you use logged in users, then, or named users, I should say, then it will also tell you that. So, and then, well, there's lots of technical work that still, um, that we can still do, but it's probably less interesting to you because it's more about, you know, how we make sure that stuff keeps working. <laughs> so, uh, well, with that, that's actually all I had to say for now. Um, if you have any questions or remarks now, then I can, uh, I can take them. And otherwise, like I said, I'll, I'm around, so we can just chat.
All right. Thank you. Eh, bueno, antes de cerrar, no sé si hay preguntas en sala o en el Zoom. Eh, si, si hay preguntas en sala, pueden acercarse a los micrófonos y hacer Microphones. Otherwise, we'd like to thank the facilitators. A big round of applause for them, please. And we invite you now to lunch. Prior to that, let me tell you that as from 2 p.m., you can go to LACNIC's booth and learn more about the campus activities. We invite you to have lunch. This will be in the, on the first floor, and we resume at 2 p.m. here or three UTC for those of us of you who are following us by Zoom. Thank you very much to all.